might be. Second one. How are you? Nice to see you. Fine. Real nice to see you. I'm uh, Arthur Fleming, uh, Chairman of the Board of uh, Health Right. We're delighted at this time to welcome the First Lady and the leaders of both the Senate and House to this particular event. As some of you know, Health Right has been dedicated to the proposition that when we have a major issue of this kind in front of us, people who are affected by this issue should be given the opportunity of talking about how the problem affects them. And they should have the opportunity of talking about that problem to people who are responsible for making the decision. And so, a couple of years ago, we sent cameras all over the country to the 50 states, to over 70 communities, in order to record what we people think about this particular problem. And thanks to the leadership of the Senate and House, we've had the opportunity of bringing some of these people to Washington from time to time on three different events where they have talked to members of the Senate, members of the House, of, about the real problems that they uh, confront. Today, we've invited five more witnesses to come and talk with us about those real problems. We recognize that we're in the closing days of one of the greatest crusades this country has ever witnessed. I had the privilege of witnessing the crusade that led to Social Security, had the opportunity of participating in the crusade, crusade that led to our civil rights program. But in my judgment, this is one of the greatest crusades this nation has ever had. It affects vitally, either now or potentially, 97% of our popula population. You know, I deeply appreciate the fact that the President and First Lady have challenged our national community to pool its resources, both public and private, in order to make possible universal coverage of acute care, long-term care, and preventive care. <laughs> now we're at this stage where some people are suggesting that possibly you can water down that particular objective. You cannot water down an objective of that kind. We must achieve the objective of universal coverage. I've seen some proposals that say, let's wait till next year, or let's wait five years for some of our people, or 10 years for some of our people. That does not make sense. Our people are vitally concerned about the health problem, and they want action now. I've lived through a period when plan after plan has been discussed. The discussion has been very good, but it has not led to any action. Just a few days ago, I was talking with one of the persons who had gone through that period, and he said to me, particularly in referring the plan presented by President Nixon. We should have gotten back at that plan and put it into effect. If we had, we'd had, if we had done that, we'd have 20 years of benefits from that plan. We would have had 20 years to improve the plan. But we missed that opportunity. That expression came to me from Doug Fraser, the former president of the United Automobiles Workers of America, who's been very active and the cause for a national health plan for, year, for years. Now we're faced with some people saying, well, 91% is all right. Put yourself in a position of an employer, public or private. Supposing he was told 91% of your people can be covered by health benefits, but you've got to select 9% of your people that cannot uh, be covered. Nobody living could make a fair intelligent decision when confronted with that situation. And yet some people are saying that the national community should settle 
for five years or ten years for 91 percent. Well, who's going to make the decision as to who the nine percent are going to be? Who can make a fair decision along that line? We need a plan that gives a health card to all of our people, that gives us one single claims form instead of a multitude of 15 or 1,700, that gives us cost containment. All of those things would disappear unless we reach the objective of universal coverage of acute, long-term care and preventive care. So we brought together today five witnesses that will talk to us about the real problems that they're confronting. We must get introduce passion into this crusade. We need the same passion that we had on the Civil Rights Crusade. As we come to the end, when we've got 50 or 60 days possibly to work, it seems to me it's imperative for the people that are really believe in this to go to the local offices of their congressmen, local offices of their senators, and say so. This is not a referendum. The Congress is the audience that we're talking to. The Congress is the body that will make the decision. And we ought to get to them and say, we want a decision, not next year, five years from now, or 10 years from now, but we want it now, because it's only with a decision of the a kind that embraces the concept of universal coverage that we can have all of these other benefits. They fit in to this concept. If this concept is not adopted, we lose it. So we're delighted to host this particular occasion. And I'd like at this, I understand that Senator Gephardt is tied up on a boat on the floor at the present time. I therefore like at this point to introduce our highly respected leader from the United States Senate, a man who has taken an unequivocal position on this issue from the start, Senator Mitchell. Frankly, I wish that Representative Gep Gephardt had been here to follow you. <laughs> so that I could have followed him. <laughs> I couldn't help thinking, Dr. Fleming, as you were speaking, and I feel certain that it ran through the minds of every person here, that first, I hope I live as long as you have lived, and secondly, if I do, I hope when I reach your age to have the same energy, the same passion, the same clarity of thought and power of speech which you have. You are. <laughs> you are an inspiration to all of us and to all Americans, and you are also evidence of the fact that there is bipartisan support for doing something about health care reform. Uh, and uh, your service. Uh, in the cabinet and since then for Americans in many areas of reform and the latest leading this crusade for health reform uh, is one for which you've earned the gratitude of all Americans and we're honored to be here with you. Uh, I begin by apologizing to all concerned that uh, I will have to leave after my brief remarks because the Senate is in session at this moment debating legislation and a vote uh, is about is to occur shortly and so I will have to give brief remarks and then leave and hold the fort until Senator Daschle can get there in time to vote as well. But I wanted to come uh, to express my gratitude to Dr. Fleming and to Mrs. Clinton, uh, who has taken up the banner of leadership on health care reform. Uh, historians will record that as the United States approached the end of the 20th century, one of the most significant actions taken was legislation to provide health insurance for all Americans uh, and that the persons most responsible for that result uh, were the First Lady of the United States and the President of the United States. Uh, 
Let's have a round of applause for Mrs. Clinton. We've come to hear uh, from others who will no doubt be more eloquent than we because they will describe their personal circumstances. And it is they and the many millions of Americans they represent who in the end are the most compelling witnesses of the need for reform. We can exhort and we can urge and we can vote but we have health insurance, and we have the best health care in the world. The people who you will hear from are not members of Congress. They're not the president or other members of the administration who have access to the best health insurance program there is and the best health care there is. And our objective is simple, that every American can have the same health insurance that members of Congress, the President, and other members of his administration have. When we get that done, we'll know they're well taken care of. We want to get insurance for every American, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because, as Dr. Fleming indicated, most of the other reforms cannot be successfully implemented unless there is coverage for all. Do not be misled by those who suggest, oh well, we can get by with doing a little bit now. Let's just reform the insurance market and then later on, in the next decade, in the next century, we'll take care of covering everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't have effective insurance market reform we cannot eliminate the prohibition against insuring those with pre-existing conditions. We can't have effective community rating unless we have universal coverage. It is not only the desired objective, it is the foundation upon which other reforms must be built. We welcome you, we look forward to hearing from you, and we look forward to working with you to see to it that in this year, this Congress will enact and this President will sign legislation providing health insurance for all Americans. That's our goal. We're going to work toward it. We look forward to it. Thank you all very much. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, to this body the distinguished Senator Thomas Dash. Thank you. Senator <laughs> Gephardt, uh, Mrs. Clinton, Dr. Fleming, and all of those assembled, thank you very much for coming and participating in yet another very successful Health Right organizational event. I must tell you, Health Right does a magnificent job in bringing us back to reality. We get all consumed sometimes with the technical terms of premium caps and mandates and all of the language of legislative initiatives that oftentimes discolor the real meaning of what it is that brings us here in the first place. And I think it's health right that brings us back to reality by bringing people from all over the country here, as we have for 200 years, petitioning Congress to do the right thing. I walked across the yard this afternoon as I came to this event. And you can't look up at that dome and all that it has meant to so many people for so long and not be moved to do the right thing. But it's you who come here petitioning Congress, reminding us why we are here, reminding us the importance of this particular challenge, reminding us of the consequences of failure, reminding us that we must respond in a meaningful way to your petitions that gives me optimism that ultimately we will succeed. The people from Health Right, the families, the individuals, those of you with stories to tell would not have to say one word. It's in your eyes. In the eyes of the children who were here just a month ago, who pleaded with Congress with nothing but their look, help us. 
recognize that without us, without all of those participating in this debate, we will fail. Recognize that this is our moment. Before the end of this decade, we must respond. It's the people in front of me right now who come in wheelchairs and on crutches, the young and the old, who give more meaning to this debate than all the statistics we can get from the Library of Congress, who recognize with us the urgency that we do it this year. So let us not give up. Let us remember the challenge given to us by past leaders, that we dream of things as they might be. We have our opportunity to bring dreams to reality. This is our moment. Let us seize that moment. Let us join together in all that we can do this year to do what we know that is right, to give meaning to that capital, to this democracy, and to the challenge that you put before us. My best wishes and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Immense contribution to this debate and effort. Uh, I uh, want to also say uh, what a great thing it is that you have been doing this through your life and you're as effective today as you have ever been in your life and when this is done you will have a huge amount of credit to be received for helping us do this. I want to um, also uh, talk about uh, the people who are involved but I want to talk about people who have insurance today. We've heard a lot about the people that don't have insurance, and all of us know that the right thing to do is to get them all involved in health insurance for their own good and for the good of everyone else. But I also want to emphasize what this means to all of us who have insurance. People today who have insurance, many, many of them are worried they're going to lose their insurance. Why? Because insurance costs go up so much every year. And so there's a fear in the country among, I would say, most of us who have insurance that we're going to lose that insurance if something isn't done to improve the way the system works for all of us. I have a letter that I want to read from constituents of mine in Missouri. Their daughter was born with Down syndrome, and they've had to spend the money for two open heart operations before their daughter was three years old. Their medical bills, as you might expect, have been astronomical, unbelievable. They had one stack of bills in their letter that they said was seven feet tall. The bills, when you stacked them up, were seven feet tall. All. They have health insurance. They're lucky, and they're very grateful for it, but they said the cost for the insurance go up every year, and they're very worried right now that they might have to give up the cardiologist who has steered their daughter through her early difficult years. The father in the family cannot change his job even though he wants to change his job because if he does, his daughter's pre-existing condition will probably disqualify them from health, health insurance. And even if there weren't a pre-existing condition, his job is such that they cannot continue to pay the increasing premiums and they're worried to death that if they lose the insurance, their daughter loses the care. When you hear stories like these, it's clear that guaranteeing coverage for every single American isn't an act of charity for the poor, it's an act of necessity for every working American family. The dozens and dozens of letters that we're presenting to the First Lady from our constituents all over the country prove this very powerful point. And you'll be hearing today from a young woman from my state of Missouri, Lisa Rausch, about just how hard it is to get decent health care coverage under today's status quo. So, ladies and gentlemen, the issue after a long, long beginning of a debate has been joined. I spend about two-thirds of every day now on health care debate. 
among the members of the House of Representatives. We are winning this fight in little bitty steps and little bitty ways every day right in these buildings as the members are voting in the House, in the committees, for real guaranteed health insurance that can never be taken away. You are involved by being here in the greatest debate of the greatest issue of our time. This is like Social Security in 1936 and Medicare in 1965. The issue has been joined and we're going to win this fight for the people of America. Thank you very much, Congressman Gephardt. Now we have the uh, privilege of uh, listening to the, uh, majority, the majority whip, uh, Congressman Monier. I, too, want to commend Arthur Fleming and Health Right for their leadership that they have shown throughout this health care debate. I also want to commend the First Lady and the President for the guts that they have shown to stand up to the special interest and to make real what Harry Truman dreamed of 50 years ago, health security for all Americans. Now, the people who say that it doesn't matter what plan we choose or whether we provide universal coverage or not, remind me of the story about the veterinarian and the taxidermist who shared the same office together. And their slogan was, either way you get your dog back. <laughs> it does make a difference. In fact, it makes all the difference. It makes a difference for working families. That's what universal coverage is, making sure every working family in America has health insurance that can never, never be taken away. Whenever I personally think about health care, I think about a group of women from my district who came to visit me not too very long ago. There were five of them. They were all single mothers. All of them worked in a nursing home. All of them made about $5 an hour. And they worked hard. They cared for people who were sick with disease and with fever. They emptied out dead, uh, bedpans, they cleaned commodes. No job was beneath them. Yet when they got sick, when they needed care, not one of them could afford to see a doctor because not one of them had health insurance. Now they were taking care of our parents and our grandparents, yet when their own children get sick, there was nobody to take care of them. One woman I'll never forget told me with tears in her eyes, she said, Congressman, I go to bed every night saying a prayer that my son doesn't get sick because if he does, I don't know what I would be able to do. It is for people like her, for the middle class working families like the ones here today that we tackle health care reform in the first place. Now this debate isn't just about the poor because they already have full coverage through Medicaid. It isn't about just the elderly because they have coverage through Medicare, although we need to improve that as well. And it isn't about the wealthy, because they already can afford good coverage on their own. Universal coverage is about middle class, working families who today have to pay for others' coverage when they can't afford to pay for their own. It's about saying that people who work hard, who pay their taxes, who play by the rules, deserve to have health care that can't be taken away, and as the majority leader in the Senate just said they ought to have health care comparable to what every member of Congress gets. And for them, this 91% solution just won't do, because if we abandon universal coverage, not only will we leave millions of working Americans without coverage, but we risk leaving every working family at risk of losing their health insurance. Now, I think we are better people than that, and we are a better nation for that. And on the issue of universal coverage, we cannot give up. We will not give up. The battle has been joined. We are on the march. We're going to make this happen. It is a mandate that the American people have sent us to this Congress to do, and with the help of each and every one of you here, as we engage in this battle in the coming weeks, we will be successful. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask uh, the majority leader to introduce the first lady. But before I ask him to do that, I'd like. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit ahead of my job. <laughs> we we first have a film to look at, which is a film of the people that we've typically been able to listen to as they've discussed real problems. Personally, I've been out in the field quite a little in the last three or four months, and I've been listening to the testimony from people like this. And I tell you, it makes a real impression. This is a film of excerpts from some of the testimony that we received. Just those patient people, the working uninsured, are concerned to me. In heart disease, oftentimes the problem happens without uh, forewarning, and you have a catastrophic illness, it's very expensive, and those people that are working, not insured, end up losing their homes. To me, that's unacceptable. I'm self-employed. I just moved here from Israel a few months ago, and I had to come here and start looking for health care. And it's very expensive, and it's not so easy to find a good policy, especially if you're self-employed. What worries me is that um, we're middle-class America, and my father made the mistake of working a little bit too hard, and she will have to enter a nursing home in a private pay situation. Um, which will be a tremendous drain on, on the income. I, as a 40-year-old worker, don't have dental care. I don't have preventative care. I don't have long-term care. Uh, I do have cover for prescriptions. Uh, one of the things that I want so bad as a 40-year-old worker in the United States is the portability of a national health care bill. What I'm finding in terms of mental illness, you either want to be a have or a have not. Um, I, if, if you are indeed a working person and you're going to look for your insurance company to make coverage, you're really going to have a limited amount of, of, of services. I have a, a friend who works in a restaurant and she, you know, she works very hard. She doesn't have any health care coverage. Her, her health is declining. My son right now is working 20 hours a day to get the deposit together to put his daughter in for surgery. And you shouldn't have to do that. Davis insurance has changed four times. I took a job thinking, well, maybe I can get insurance with my job. They won't cover him because of his pre-existing conditions. Um, you can't borrow that much money. We took out loans in a bank to try to cover the medical bills, but you just make more medical bills, and then you get further in debt. They're, the only thing that you can possibly do to make a difference is vote, and then you keep your fingers crossed. My concern is if something does happen to my health, one visit to the hospital will uh, will put me uh, in bankruptcy. My husband had to quit his job, um, sold his barbershop, because somebody had to be home with Ryan. And my job covered the health insurance, so my job is the one that stayed. It's damned high time we start listening to the average person and the poor person. And in, in regard, we've been so protective of the wealthy. Uh, and, and, you know, and this is not a logical society. I think eventually it's going to kill the American system. and. and and, and it's called greed. It's unbelievable that this country, it's the greatest country in the world, the most intelligent people in this country, cannot get together in the Beltline in Washington, D.C. and get the National Health Security Act passed. But I would want to tell them that if they call themselves human beings, I want to tell them that they should be ashamed, that they cannot allow all its people that they represent to have the same benefits, the same right for, for to when, when they get sick and get cared for like they can afford. One thing that I, I think just has to be done is that universal health care. You just cannot let that go by. There isn't anybody in this country who shouldn't be entitled to some kind of... I was some straight talk from people who are confronted with real problems. Now we have some people here who are prepared to present with the evidence of that nature. The first one is Lisa Rausch from Kansas City, Missouri. Hi, I'm Lisa Rausch from Kansas City, Missouri. I'm 26 years old. 
I graduated from college. I got a job for a nonprofit where I've worked for about four years. I come from a pretty functional family. I live in a livable city, and I never thought that somebody like me would be unable to get the health care that I need. I certainly never believed I'd be standing here telling my medical history to a room full of strangers, very important strangers, <laughs> but strangers. Um, and I never believed that our country's health care system was designed to ensure you if you're healthy and abandon you if you're not. Well, I was a bit naive. I was diagnosed with a hormonal disorder when I was in college and treated by an endocrinologist. Then I turned 24 and my parents' health insurance company dropped me. I was too old. Okay, I have a job. I thought, no problem. My employer's health insurance company took one look at my medical records and refused to take me. I still didn't panic. I thought, all right, I'll just buy an individual policy. Well, I was rejected by Blue Cross Blue Shield and every other major health insurance company in the Kansas City area that even looked at my application. So I did panic. I got desperate. My friends got a little tired of hearing me talk about it and things got ridiculous. They started saying, well, how about a marriage of convenience so you could get coverage, you know? Uh, state prisoners get health care. That's always an option. Um, then someone suggested I could run for office because those folks are covered. Um, none of these options sounded very appealing, but I needed my medication. <laughs> Um, and I hadn't been taking my medication since my coverage was dropped. I was on six different kinds of pills a day. Uh, one of them was a dollar a pill, and I took two of those every day. It was either stop taking the medication or not pay my rent. So I stopped taking it. Um, I tried to get one of those bare bones plans, one of those month to month policies. So in case I cracked my skull, I could pay a mere $2,000 a month instead of, uh, sending my parents into bankruptcy. But once again, the voice on the phone told me they couldn't cover me. I tried for four months filling out applications, condensing my medical history so it would fit into those little boxes, photocopying my medical records and sharing them with countless insurance bureaucrats, and writing pathetic cover letters, begging someone to take my money and insure me. And they all said the same thing. I remember telling myself at one point that that's okay. If I got really sick or if I broke my arm, I could get into my car and drive it into a tree because I do have auto insurance. An attorney friend of mine did some digging around and found something called the Missouri Health Insurance Pool. It's a risk pool for people like me with pre-existing conditions. So now I have coverage, but the coverage is $368 a month. I have a $500 deductible. My pre-existing condition is not covered and because I work for nonprofit, I can't afford to pay out of pocket uh, for the medication and the doctor's visits that I need. Um, my employer right now is paying that $368 a month, and I appreciate that. But they are also considering adding a clause to our personnel policies that says at any given time the board of directors can eliminate health care for their employees. Now, I love my job, and you know, for about two minutes I actually felt guilty because I was a financial burden to my organization. But those premiums are 25% of my salary, and I can't do it. If they adopt this policy, I'll be uninsured. If I ever lose my job, I will be uninsured. If I try and change jobs, unless my new employer agrees to pay that $368 a month, I'll be uninsured. And here's the kicker. Even with the $368 a month, I can't afford to see a doctor and get the medication that I need. I'm young, but I am not naive, and I know that life isn't fair. I also know that our health care system is currently very wrong. Through no fault of my own, I can't get the health care I need. I did the right things. I went to school. I got a job. I work hard. I think it's time for health care reform. We need health care reform that has universal coverage, that is affordable that covers pre-existing conditions, and I appreciate Congressman Wheat, my congressman's efforts to make sure pre-existing conditions are covered, and we need it now. I thank Health Right for letting me tell my story, and thanks for listening. Thank you very, very much for that testimony. I now would like to introduce Edwin and Gladys Ruiz from Newark, New Jersey.
Hi, my name is Gladys, and this is my husband, Edwin. Um, I also uh, had a problem for seven years without any health insurance whatsoever. I've worked for seven years. Um, I'm currently employed uh, part-time because my employer does, says he cannot afford to pay for health insurance. Uh, I am now covered now. My husband recently became a police officer, so we're covered through him. I have two boys, 8 and 13, which they were not covered for that amount of time, seven years. Whenever they got sick, I had a problem because I didn't know, maybe, should I take them? Is it serious enough? Maybe they'll be okay, you know, they'll be okay to go away. Um, I've had to um, actually, like, wait and wait to see if they get better. And then I can't afford to take them to a doctor, so I say, well, let's try the emergency room. They'll bill us later. But the bills just keep uh, stacking and stacking. You know, um, I'm not in that situation now, and now we have health coverage. Um, but I know a lot of people who do need the help. My sister, for one, she's living off uh, public assistance. She's tried to go out to work, but she thinks it's better to stay on the public assistance because she has a three-year-old and a nine-year-old. And no one wants to offer the insurance. So she stays on public assistance. Um, I now have the coverage, and what I would like is some guarantee that, God forbid, something should happen that my husband loses his job or something, some kind of guarantee that I will keep my coverage. You know. And, of course, for those who, people who do live on uh, public assistance that do want to go out and work to get some kind of coverage, my sister's had a job, uh, two jobs actually, in less than two months and it's left it because they don't want to give her the health insurance and uh, welfare says, we're going to get you, take you off because you're making X amount of money, so we're, you know, we have to catch, cut you off. It's not fair. So she leaves her job and goes back home. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Next, I'd like to introduce Ruby Oz of uh, Oklahoma. Hello, I'm Ruby Earl from Oklahoma, and this is my daughter, Sam. We're from Oklahoma. Uh, my husband, he was a, a hard, worked hard. He was self-employed. He worked as a labor. And I have worked at a nursing home for years. Well, he had, lately he died with cancer. And we, we didn't have no insurance, so he couldn't afford to go to the doctor because we couldn't afford it. Maybe if his cancer would have been discovered, earlier that he would maybe still be alive today but we couldn't afford it because we didn't have no insurance and his uh, morphine bill for less than two months run over nine thousand dollars which leaves me a bill still to pay because i'm working at a nursing home well i'm working at a nursing home and i didn't have no insurance either and i still am working at the nursing home and i still have no insurance and uh it's hard when you are working the working people and they can't afford to go to the doctors and have health, health insurance. So uh, when my husband got sick, I had to quit my job to take care of my husband at home because we didn't have any assistance. But I'm back at work now at the nursing home again and I still have no insurance assistance. So I'm looking for the Congress to do a good job and give us working people some Medicare insurance that we can afford. Um, I guess I'd just like to bring into it that uh, the first thing my father asked me when he was uh, told about the treatment that was available for lung cancer was radiation treatment. And he looked at me and said, how will I afford that? Um, how will your mother afford it when I'm dead? And uh, as a nurse, I'm looking forward to the time when the first question asked to me is not how will I cover it, how will I pay for it, but what are we going to do about it, how are we going to fix me. And I'd like to thank the First Lady and others for all their work, and I would like to challenge Congress to come up and pass this bill and take care of the backbone of America, the working people.
Now I'd like to introduce uh, Candy DeRoos of St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm a Candace DeRoos, and I'm a 39. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm a 39 year old single parent. Um, I'm here today. I don't know why or how, I guess, just to hopefully show people that you know what I'm going through and um, I'm working four jobs right now uh, they're all part-time although I've tried to get a full-time one um, and they're all great jobs I work for the St. Paul Saints baseball and I did that last year it's seasonal I work for the Dakota County court system I'm a court attendant but it's a part-time job and I also work uh, I've worked for the last four years even while I was on welfare for a while uh, as a, at a human services nonprofit agency, uh, working the crisis lines and working with uh, Metro Mobility, and uh, it's, an, it's a multi-service organization. And I also work retail for a, a tourist um, store too. And uh, I work seven days a week, and I'm trying to raise my son. Uh, I I don't get any child support, and um, I had to go on welfare for my full-time job, which I had benefits for a while, and uh, and um, uh, now I pulled myself off of welfare. I'm kind of nervous, um, and uh, I've been told that I do their medical uh, program, and um, I've been told I can reapply, but um, it's going to require lots of more paperwork, and they have a file on me this huge, and and um, <laughs> it's going to take about three days off of work and at five dollars an hour um, some of the jobs I, I can't afford to take off work and and take a number and and <coughs> apply again uh, i'm just it'll it'll make me sink i won't be able to make my house payment but i'm doing it and um uh, in order to not get an appointment in the next two and a half months i'm I've uh, been told that I can get an appointment in July if I reapply for welfare, which I don't want to do. But um, I, I need to have medical insurance because I have uh, a disability which requires um, medication, $100 a month. And I also um, have my son in a mental health um, care uh, program, and um, we're having a lot of problems with that, even while we were on the, the welfare medical they, they switched us a few different times, and then when we were just in the se therapy sessions, we were told that we couldn't go to that therapist anymore. So I believe in choice, and I believe in health care for everyone. Um, you know, I, I grew up thinking uh, or knowing that we the people for the people, and we should all be for the people, and we all should take a look at our attitudes and, and, um, and take care of each other. You know, we're all human beings here, and if uh, we don't have health care, um, uh, I'll, uh, in all areas, um, mentally, dentally, uh, physically, uh, we're not going to live and to our full potential. And if we're going to have to keep going through all the, the paperwork and everything, uh, uh, that's a whole learning process and a job in itself. We're not going to be able to get educated in school. And uh, I hope I can live to be um, uh, Mr. Fleming's age and, and do what he's doing um, uh, in our community. And for our country, and I hope that everyone else can too. And I thank you, and I'm really happy to be here today. Thanks. Our final witness today is Deborah Demick from Grants Pass, Oregon. Just a bit taller. Hi, I'm Deborah Dimmick, and I'm here um, on behalf of my family, my husband Ray, and I have five children. Um, just we've just lived in Grants Pass about two and a half years. We relocated from Southern Ca California, where we owned our own business. Um, we were doing fairly well, and never thought this would happen to us, but uh, it did, and it could happen to anyone. Anyone could be in my shoes today. We were paying fairly high premiums um, with a large deductible. My husband came down with, at that time it was undiagnosed, he came down with Lou Gehrig's disease. 
which um, at the time was diagnosed as stress, too many, too many drives on the LA freeways, and which was not what it was. So we were uh, advised by the doctor to relocate. So we decided we'd move to Grants Pass, Oregon and get rid of our business and just start over and, and see if his blood pressure would go down and get better which um, at, during that time, our financial situation was getting very poor because he wasn't able to work during that time. So we um, had to drop our health care insurance and we were, assured, we were sure that we would be able to pick it back up after we moved and uh, due to his declining condition uh, after we relocated, he was not eligible because of pre-existing conditions for medical coverage. During that time, we incurred um, excessive doctor bills trying to get his um, physical condition diagnosed, and it finally was diagnosed. And of course, then we knew he would not be covered, you know, for anything, and he would not be able to work. Also, we had to cash out all our resources, and were forced to go on welfare, um, waiting for our Medicare to kick in. And it was um, we our only hope at that time was just to hope that his disease would not progress. Uh, any further until Medicare kicked in and um, we had some type of coverage because the, the, we had already incurred so much medically. So um, we, we managed to make it over the, the hump, but during this time it was very, um, very fear, um, we were very fearful of, of any of the other of us getting sick because we were not covered. Um, my, my major concern is with knowing of, of his his, he is terminally ill, and I would like to see that after his death that I would be able to get back out into the workforce and not forced to stay on the welfare system. I have five children, and I've been advised many times just to um, just to just stay comfortable and and do uh, you know do nothing pretty much, and just the system will take care of me. I want to be out there with the working force, the backbone of America, taking care of my five children, showing them that we can make it and that we are eligible for health care coverage and not have to live at the poverty level any longer. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much. And uh, it's now my great privilege to reintroduce Congressman Gephardt. But before I do, let me say this, that I think one of the things that we need to work out, all of us, is recreating the atmosphere that we had in this country on the day that uh, the president presented this plan for universal coverage uh, to our people. And also, the five days that when the First Lady was testifying here before Congress. Between them, they gave millions of people hope who are living in despair. And uh, I can say that I started to testify uh, up here before Congress uh, 30 or 55 years ago. <laughs> and I've testified many times since then. Hard it is to find an agreement among representatives of all of our people in this great diverse country where we have so many backgrounds and interests and viewpoints. Uh, these halls and rooms are where we forge that essential agreement, that consensus. And the reason we have not until now been able to get that consensus on health care has been that we have never had sufficient leadership in the country from the president to pull us together as a people to do something that is very, very hard to do. I told the president and Hillary way back at the time when they came into office that we had tried very hard in the Democratic caucus to reform the health care system before the 1992 election. I helped lead that effort, and we failed. And we failed because at the time we did not have a president who led us and talked to us and talked to the American people 
to pull together the kind of consent and reconciliation of ideas that you need to do this. And how proud I was that we finally had a president and a first lady who would lead us in this effort. I'm confident we're going to get this done, not just because of people like this who had the courage to come here and tell their story, but because we have a president who has the courage to take this kind of tough issue on. When the chances of failure are still high, and when the risk of not getting it through is there. But I'm also confident because of his courage and the courage of the lady that I am to introduce to you. When the history of this period is written, it will be said America enacted health care reform because the people demanded it and because we had a president and a first lady who led us to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, am always grateful uh, that Health right uh, holds events like this. Um, I'm also grateful they don't do it every day. I could not emotionally take it every day because what they do is to break through the uh, um, sometimes necessary uh, self-protection that exists uh, among those of us who care about this issue um, and who see the faces of the people we have heard from today and the thousands of others through this past year and know what a incredible obligation we face to provide health care to every American. I particularly want to thank Candy and Lisa and Edwin and Gladys and Ruby and Deborah for sharing their stories. Uh, it is not easy, as you've already heard, standing up and talking to people about your medical condition. Uh, and I am grateful that each one of these uh, speakers today was willing to do that uh, because they were able to stand for millions of other Americans. Each one of their stories is not their own personal story alone. It is the story of many, many other Americans who are not here physically but are here in spirit because they face the same challenges because of our health care system. I was thinking as I heard these testimonies from working middle class Americans that in the last three years nearly three million more Americans have lost their insurance. When my husband started running for president the best estimate was we had about 37 million uninsured Americans. 85% of whom worked and were in working families. Now the best estimate is that we're closer to 40 million, and the numbers are continuing to rise. That is approximately 1% of our population that has become uninsured in the last three years. If we had an epidemic that had affected 3 million Americans in the last three years, we would certainly be mobilized to act. If we'd had an extraordinary national disaster that had occurred, like we've unfortunately suffered in the last years with earthquakes and floods and hurricanes that affected three million people, we would be mobilized. Well, sometimes unseen by those of us who live in a place like Washington and are well insured, millions of Americans are living through their own personal disaster. And we've heard some of those stories. Because although we have the finest health care system in the world, we have not yet figured out how to make it available and affordable for every single American. There's been a lot of talk in the last few weeks about why we need 
to reach the President's principal goal, which is that every American will be guaranteed health insurance. And I'd like to just review briefly the reasons why that is the goal. Because as has been said, no other reform in our health care system will work if we do not achieve guaranteed universal coverage. Arthur Fleming, who has led health rights efforts, wrote an article along with former Secretary and Attorney General Elliot Richardson which outlined clearly what was at stake and why universal coverage must remain the goal. First, because it is those in the middle, the great majority of Americans, the people who have been referred to as the backbone, the people who work in the nursing homes, the people who keep our businesses going, the people who do four part-time jobs, these are the people who will be the ones left out and disadvantaged without universal coverage. If you are rich enough, you will have health insurance. If you are poor enough, you will have health insurance. And it is people in the middle, the vast majority, who either are now losing it and are among the now 40 million uninsured, or who are one job, one divorce, one accident, one illness away from losing their health insurance. Secondly, people with insurance will continue to pay for people without insurance. This is a point that cannot be made too often because too many people with insurance give a great sigh of relief and say, well, thank goodness they're not talking about me. Well, we are talking about the insured because for every increase in the uninsured, those who are insured pay. We pay because eventually people get health care. We heard how if you do finally make the decision, if you are in the position that uh, Edwin and Gladys are, and you don't have insurance for your children, and you wait and wait, eventually you do end up at the emergency room. Those who are insured pay for the care that is given. Third responsible businesses will continue to pay the price because the businesses that currently insure will be charged more and more to make up for those who are uninsured and to pay for the care that the uninsured receive. It is a vicious cycle we are caught in. The more you have uninsured, they continue to receive care the more the cost gets shifted to those who pay the bill, who pay more and therefore decide to drop coverage for people because they can no longer afford to provide it, thereby putting more people into the uninsured pool, which puts more and more of a financial burden on the businesses and individuals who pay the bills. Billions will continue to be wasted on last-minute emergency-related acute care we don't know what the outcome would have been for Ruby's husband. We will never know. But we do know that there are millions and millions of people like Ruby's husband who don't get the care they need until the last possible moment, which thereby costs all of us more money than it would have if they had gotten preventive and timely care in the meantime. We cannot get costs under control without universal coverage. That is particularly important in regard to the federal budget because those of you who are in Congress and those who cover Congress know that although we finally have a responsible budget, we finally have the deficit going down. It will go down for the third time in a row, and that has not happened since Harry Truman was president. We finally are cutting discretionary spending. We are finally moving the federal workforce back to the level it was before 1980. We are doing what we need to do to control the federal budget. But we cannot keep the budget under control unless you control health care costs. So what will happen if we don't have comprehensive health care reform with universal coverage that controls costs? There will be pressure 
to cut back on Medicaid and Medicare. You can hear some in the Congress already saying, some who don't seem to understand the relationship between cutting back on expenditures in Medicare to try to control the federal budget is like holding on to a balloon that pops out somewhere else. You can look at any state and any business and you can see what the result will be if we try to control only Medicare and Medicaid by cutting reimbursement levels there, thinking we are getting entitlements under control, what will happen is as costs begin to be decreased in terms of what hospitals and doctors get from Medicare and Medicaid, costs will be shifted onto private payers, businesses and individuals. I spoke to a group of North Carolina business people and I explained that Medicare now only pays 90% of the cost of health care in North Carolina on average. So therefore the businesses in North Carolina, particularly the small businesses, pay a 30 to 40% surcharge to try to get to something resembling cost. So the more you cut Medicare and Medicaid from the top, the more the cost gets shifted onto the backs of businesses and individuals, the more they decide they cannot pay for it, the more people then get dropped and end up being uninsured, therefore eligible for Medicaid, and the cost cycle continues to spiral out of control. Every American risks losing their health insurance. There is not one of us in this room who can with any certainty say we will have the same health care coverage this time next year to cover the same benefits at the same cost. We also are seeing the result of breaking the link between responsible behavior and work and health care when we hear stories that I hear all the time, particularly what we heard from uh, both uh, Deborah and Gladys, about people who have to stay on welfare because if they leave welfare to go into a job without benefits, they cannot provide health care for their children. So we will continue to pay more to cover less. We will continue to see thousands of Americans stay on welfare, not because they want to, but because that's where they get their health care benefits. All of these problems will get worse in the absence of universal coverage. This is not a static status quo. This is a deteriorating status quo. So on nearly every argument one can make, economics, social justice, political effectiveness, moral, ethical, the right decision is to do what all of our speakers have asked, and that is for the Congress to give to Americans the same guarantee of health coverage that they have for themselves. That is what we who are in government owe the people who pay our salaries, pay for our health benefits, and basically want all of those who are in government in the executive and the legislative branch to hear them and understand that we owe working middle-class Americans the same health security that they give to all of us. Thank you very much. I certainly appreciate the comments that the First Lady has just made. It's a wonderful challenge to our national community. You know, as I sit, sat here listening to these witnesses, and I've sat listening to similar witnesses throughout the country, I couldn't help but think, for my entire lifetime, we've had a health care system that has put first the salaries and the uh, return of shareholders and so on, and people second. And here is a proposal from the President of the United States and from the First Lady to a long last, as far as health care is concerned, put people first and then require other persons to adjust 
to the needs that people have. What's more fundamental and imperative than health care? We certainly appreciate the contributions that our witnesses have made today, the contributions that leaders of the Congress have made. I believe that we're in the last 50 or 60 days of a crusade that at long last will succeed. And I appreciate the contributions that everyone has made today as we look forward to achieving that objective.